这个十六有十六年历史的一个一个 NGO， 一个古呃传统的 NGO， 但是 s i r j a y 他在这边待了十年，然后他待了两年之后，他带领这个组织做了一些新的新的改革，用用一些新的数位的方式，然后扩大参与哦。那这这条路其实台湾也有陆续在走，那我们来听他的分享。Hello, um, it's really a pleasure to be here, and、um, I understand that probably the first question that I should ask is whether you have ever heard of the country that I come from.、Uh, could you raise your hands?、Uh, who have heard about Lithuania before? You give me promise. Thank you.、Um, I expect that by the end of this session, once I'm done. Um, and if I ask you to raise your hands again, everybody will have Googled it,、um, and that is the power of technology that we have nowadays.、Um, when I was coming up with the、uh, name of my presentation, I must admit it was uh, a uh, late evening in Vilnius, the capital city of the country that I come from,、um, and、uh, I couldn't quite decide on the title, so I used、uh, this double hit.、Um, and the reason why I did that is because. I think that it is quite representative of、uh, where we stand, and、uh, I was supposed not to touch anything, which I didn't do.、Um, and we need help, and it's all back again. Didn't do anything, I promise.、Um, and it also is quite representative of the uh, organization um, and its challenges.、Uh, That、uh, we deal with, and I come from,、um, on a daily basis.、Um, I come from Transparency International.、Um, have you guys heard about such an organization?、Uh, just one person. Okay. So very quickly, Transparency International、uh, is a global network of、uh, organizations, chapters that、uh, work all around the world on issues of accountability, transparency, and anti-corruption. And I work for an organization that is called Transparency International Lithuania. So we work on such issues、uh, in Lithuania. You can Google us at the transparency.lt. There's also an English version of it. And uh, what uh, we have、uh, on our hands is a group of seven people,、uh, seven staff members, five, six volunteers all the time. So about a dozen of people engaged in this work in Lithuania on a daily basis for the past 16 years. Um, our budget is approximately three three hundred thousand euros, um, uh, and that kind of gives you、um, sort of a sense of the punch that we have.、Uh, we are also known by about every fifth, every sixth person in the country,、um, nearly every second business person in the country, which also gives you a sense of uh, uh, the uh, critical weight that we've managed to assemble over the past、uh, decade and a half. Which I think will be useful for you to know、uh, once I go forward with uh, uh, my presentation, because I think this is precise to what a lot of NGOs, advocacy NGOs, awareness raising NGOs have. That anybody,、uh, whether it's media, uh, uh, whether it's uh, IT uh, developers, uh, uh, probably do have in mind、uh, once they go、uh, and look for partners、uh, from the NGO world. But in the beginning, let me.、Uh, Set the scene of where we are at. I think that、uh, in the present-day world,、uh, CSOs,、uh, civil society organizations, NGOs, uh, uh,、um, other organizations of this kind get fewer breaks. And by that I mean is that the world has changed, and it has become a more difficult world to work in for a non-governmental organization, for any civil society representative, compared to what it was. Ten, twenty, or thirty years ago, we all know that the space for civil society all around the world is shrinking. We know that many countries、uh, around the globe now have laws that make it more difficult for civil society organizations to actually work、uh, with the government, work with the business. And this is something which you must keep in mind if you are an NGO that wants to stay relevant. You realize that. The time that you have in your hands is not a given, and that you have to continuously, constantly look for new ways to become more effective and more engaged. You also understand that while、uh, the public often trusts 
hurts you the most. And we see that from Darius research, for instance, the uh, Bertelsmann's uh, uh, work. Um, it's, again, something which uh, is not the same as it was 10 or 20 years ago. NGOs are increasingly being asked to uh, walk the talk, do exactly the same things that they preach for and ask for from the public or the private sectors. Uh, they has to be more accountable, more transparent, to show that they also manage their own risks and that they actually can live up to public expectations. And finally, I think that NGOs nowadays uh, um, uh, must realize, and I know that many of them do so, that the world is speeding up and they live in the world that is rapidly changing. There's uh, new technologies, uh, new expectations from the public coming their way every single day. And the sooner an organization realizes that, the uh, better it will be um, off um, in the years to come. And this is the um, mindset that uh, we have been approaching our work for the past 15 or 16 years now. This is me. Um, I didn't do it myself. Uh, it's a caricature from one of the uh, uh, media outlets. It was supposed to be, I think, a negative caricature, uh, but I think it also represents well the work that we've been doing because over the past 15 years, uh, our DNA has been such that we have approached every single activity uh, of ours with the mindset of uh, realizing that measured efforts are key to sustain long-term success. Fifteen years ago, we started out as an organization that was uh, really just doing research on anti-corruption. Um, Fifteen, sixteen years ago, the C word, the corruption word, and I mentioned to you that we work with accountability and transparency and anti-corruption, really was uh, vaguely existent in the country I come from. You know now from the Google searches that I'm sure you did that we're a former Soviet republic, we're a new democracy, and just like anywhere in the world uh, at that time, a lot of changes were taking place in Lithuania. And that's late 1990s, early 2000 plus. And uh, uh, a lot of politicians and public servants that we uh, had in Lithuania at that moment really did not know what corruption was. As a matter of fact, the whole issue of corruption and the uh, presence of corruption in the country was disputed. So what we did a lot of was really mapping out the situation in the country. We made sure that we have a lot of sociological survey data. We polled the public, we polled uh, business people, and I think what we have succeeded uh, in is to make sure that uh, uh, there was this general acceptance of the fact that corruption does exist in a country like Lithuania and uh, that something has to be done about it. What we have realized, however, over the course of this ye uh, period, of these years, was that it was not enough just to know that corruption is a problem. And for an NGO like ours, if we were to look for sustained success in the field of our work, we needed to come up with solutions and concrete proposals on how to actually tackle this huge issue. And what we saw is that uh, because of uh, um, the nature of our uh, society uh, and probably the history um, of the way uh, the civil society has developed, there was not uh, a lot uh, of um, traction in the field if we were not to take greater uh, role in this particular process ourselves. So we started developing proposals. We realized that uh, we need to start getting engaged in advocacy and it was not enough just to do awareness raising and research. And when we started doing that, we realized that actually it's uh, something which uh, uh, is not really possible uh, if you do it just by yourself. Uh, and the reason for that is actually very simple. Uh, if you're an NGO and you have a staff of five, six, seven people, and we were smaller at the time, you can actually do certain things, that's for sure. However, a lot of times you will be seen as an outsider. If you speak about the issues in the healthcare sector, if you speak about the issues in sport, uh, what you realize very quickly is that you need to be on the inside of those processes for you to make any actual difference. So really early on, we learned our lessons and we realized that we need to mobilize people, we need to connect people, and this is one of the strengths that we had. Because otherwise, what you can end up being uh, uh, or look like uh, is this. Um, have you heard about Three Musketeers and uh, D'Artagnan? 
uh, just one person has. How many of you re recognize these guys? I mean, they're stylized, obviously. Um, they didn't look this way in the uh, 19th century, but um, actually earlier. Um, there's this book by Alexander Dumas. Uh, it's called Three Musketeers. Surely you've heard about the movie. Yeah, the book? You have. Could you raise your hands if we're on the same uh, track? One, two. Great. So um, we'll have fun. OK, so the reason why I use this uh, particular visual is because uh, these guys were awesome. They went around France, and uh, they uh, really did a lot of uh, cool things. They had a lot of adventures. There were these romantic heroes that were there to save the day, make sure that uh, uh, the bad guys are punished and the good guys prevail. My pitch would be is that in the 21st century, uh, even if you have a group of really talented individuals that know how to fight and achieve their goals, you're pretty much a Don Quixotis, um, uh, or perceived as such. And a lot of people would think that you're fighting windmills. Do you know who Don Quixotis is? It's this guy on the horse. Uh, I'm using a lot, a lot of European uh, um, comparisons, but maybe that's a good thing. Um, and basically, you're not really effective, because uh, the public would nowadays expect you to be um, something else. They would expect you to actually go out and do things uh, with them. And uh, I think that the reality of the everyday uh, work of an NGO uh, in any country, for that matter, is not to be just proactive, as these gentlemen were, but to be reactive. And I know that, say, a couple of years back, this was still a relatively negative word. It often was associated with you sitting there in your place and waiting for things to come your way. But as a matter of fact, you can be proactive and reactive at the same time. Would you agree? Uh, what we have realized over and over again is that as an NGO, you need to constantly be on the lookout for new opportunities. And if somebody comes your way and offers you a great idea, offers to cooperate on a particular issue, you cannot tell that person that you have your action plan for this year all set in stone and ready in the beginning of January and you will not pick it up. You have to find a way for you to be engaged with that particular organization or an individual, not necessarily by working day in and day out, but uh, together with them, but maybe connecting them with somebody, introducing to somebody, coming back to those people a little bit later. But that's actually very important because you realize that a lot of partnerships that you have are not as solid and set in stone anymore as they were five or ten years ago. People live in the age of noise, and people have a lot of interests. And if you have any pretense as an NGO to actually get engaged with the public and make sure that people are interested in what you do, and you really are willing to relate to them and help them relate to you, you need to use every single opportunity that comes your way. Because that opportunity might mean that you have that particular person interested in your work just for a day or for a week of the entire year. And that's when your planets and stars match and coincide in terms of positions. And that's when you take action. And you do something for a day. You do something for a week together. And then you wait once your slides are up back again, which they will be. Thank you very much. And you do the same thing with somebody else. And that is fine. An example of that uh, that we have in Lithuania is an action we carry out, conduct together with the uh, students uh, from, medical, uh, uh, um, from the medical profession. Uh, there's a lot of problems um, in Lithuania when it comes to corruption in the healthcare sector. But what we do with them is an initiative uh, which lasts for one week every year. They do it themselves. We help them out in terms of logistics. And really, uh, it is just a seven-day period that we work together on that particular issue. Uh, and that's OK. Um, with somebody else, we work on another issue another week. But again, um, this is what I have in mind when I speak about sort of using every single opportunity and realizing that you don't need to work with particular partners every day of the week throughout the year. But 
you sometimes just do ad hoc things. Now, finally, I think that NGOs uh, nowadays have to see themselves, increasingly so, as platforms, as uh, flagships, if you will, um, for anybody to um, uh, rely on uh, in any kind of activities. Because let's face it, the reality of the matter is, is that regardless of whether you are a hacker, a civic activist, uh, or just a in concerned individual, your metabolism, that is the pace that you live with, is much quicker than that one of an NGO. Just like the uh, metabolism of an NGO is much uh, uh, quicker than uh, the metabolism of um, a public sector organization or business. Um, an individual that is interested in a particular uh, subject or wants to develop a particular website, uh, gather a particular set of data, um, usually has that interest only for a couple of years. Then, and that's uh, something which I've seen time and time uh, over and over again, then things happen. Um, that person gets married, uh, gets a kid. The job that he or she is in uh, changes and uh, they have to move elsewhere. And really cool stuff that they've developed often is left orphaned. And uh, the question then is who picks it up and who continues to develop it, who takes care of it? Or, um, as uh, it has happened with us on uh, numerous occasions, uh, an individual needs help, uh, needs help in terms of logistics, uh, needs to understand whom else to work with or how to get certain data. And again, an NGO with its network of connections, uh, its ability to raise public awareness, get to the media, uh, can help that particular person to get their goals in place. And that's why I'm so happy that I can share with you a number of initiatives that we get it out now that we've set the scene for what it is that we're really about. As I mentioned to you, we're an organization of just a dozen of people, so it's not really a lot. Um, but at the end of the day, we do a lot of really different stuff, not only with people on the ground every day, day in and day out, but also online. And that is something which we started doing about seven or eight years ago, having realized that we can speak about public engagement, and we can speak about uh, uh, things that we like as much as we want, but as long as we do not embrace technology and do not start working with IT programmers, uh, hackers, we're looking at very small numbers of the public actually being engaged. And as our DNA, as our mission has changed, we realize that it is not enough to just pride yourself on the research that you've carried out, if you want people to use that research, and more importantly, if you want people to understand what it is that you do, you have to become this connecting, this messenger of change. And our mission now is something else. We realize that uh, for us to be truly successful, we want to make sure that it's not only us who say people should be the owners of their state, but it's really about making sure that every single person can be an owner uh, of Lithuania, because at the end of the day, uh, as a citizen, you are an owner of your state through actions that they take with the help of our work. And in this particular case, it's technology. Now, the numbers that you see here now probably should be multiplied by eight for Taiwan because Lithuania is a country of just three million people. So if you have about 21 million in Taiwan, I suppose that you know, these numbers, uh, just to be proportionate, have to be multiplied by eight. And again, that's what uh, gives you a bit of a better perspective as to uh, how effective or not our tools in Lithuania have been. They're a little bit inflated by the transparency school that we organize, but the bottom line is that if you look at these initiatives, they all represent a very uh, different approach to how one can engage with the public sector and online community and uh, IT developers um, in every single uh, uh, instance. And if you let me, I'll go through a number of these now. So Manus Amos, the one that you see there on the, um, oh, it's the right, my right, your left, is an initiative that we um, developed uh, for the first time about five years ago. And it was an initiative, it's minusamers.ot, you can uh, see how it looks like um, online, which really originated from one individual, a guy called Ignas Rubikas, 
uh, a youngster who was only starting his university degree in the UK, who had this crazy idea at that time to actually make sure that people would know how politicians in parliament have voted on the most important issues over the span of four years of them being in office. He just had an idea. He really had no funding. Uh, and what he was looking for is help to fundraise and actually develop this particular portal. He did not want to have an organization. He just wanted to have this idea to happen. So what we did together with him, we helped him, helped him fundraise. He did a lot of fundraising then himself as well. We managed to develop a website, which in the span of uh, about uh, three weeks before the elections, uh, four years ago, managed to attract uh, about 30,000 unique visitors. Uh, now, this is not a very big number for Taiwan. It was a very big number for Lithuania at that point. Remember, uh, we agreed that you multiply it by eight. And more importantly, what we saw from our data, uh, every sixth Lithuanian residing in the capital, because that's uh, where, first of all, most of the users of any online tools of ours would come from, use this particular platform to go and see which political party would have voted, or that is, which political party uh, voted one or the other way, and which political party has voted the way he or she would have voted in the span of the four years that we have, uh, that, that we had before that election. Now we're developing a new platform with the new set of questions, with the same guy, and I guess the point there is, is that uh, you can have some like that uh, if you are an individual and you find an organization that is willing to uh, develop this thing together if it's a win-win. And it was a win-win for us because obviously we got something which uh, one could possibly only dream of five years ago, developing a website like that. In the span of those four years between the elections, we also updated Manosemas.lt a number of times. And now we see that every year, uh, with the data that it has now, um, we have about 15,000 unique visitors uh, on this website annually, which is a good thing because uh, while the elections are not taking place, now you can see such uh, information as, for instance, how um, uh, parliamentarians um, attend uh, meetings, uh, how many of their proposals have been um, actually successfully voted for, what it is that they talk about. Um, you can actually uh, see information on who submits different legal proposals um, to the parliament. And that is something which the official website of our parliament does not have in such an accessible manner. So it stays topical throughout the four-year span. If you look at uh, uh, Atverastasmus, uh, that's, again, a different kind of initiative. It's something which we developed with the National Administration of Courts. Uh, it was not an individual coming our way, but it was uh, an institution that decided that it will open up its data and allow us to come up for the first time ever in Lithuania with the ranking of court performance and the performance of judges in the country, uh, which was something that never had happened before and uh, had allowed us to uh, actually show which courts process cases quicker than others, which decisions uh, by various judges are uh, more stable, that is, are not being uh, appealed. And I think just the process uh, of engaging with this particular institution allowed that particular uh, uh, organization, the National uh, Administration of Courts, and the judiciary in Lithuania to understand better how it is that they evaluate the performance of their judges and what it is that needs to be done for them to perform in a different manner. An initiative like Stirna.info uh, is something which, again, we did uh, in a slightly different manner from the first two. And that is uh, we looked at the data that was available on uh, the owners of media in Lithuania. And uh, we decided that uh, we will come up with one single portal, one single website, which would allow us to see who owns what in our country. At that time, uh, that kind of data uh, had been uh, uh, collected by two different uh, organizations, the Ministry of Culture and the Commission for Radio and Television, uh, for about uh, more than 10 years. But nobody could make sense of uh, who uh, the owners of uh, media outlets in Lithuania are. 
uh, we uh, uh, got a lot of volunteers uh, to go through Excel sheets. We got an IT uh, developer to help us come up with a website that made sense. And now what we see uh, is that this particular website is being visited by about 20,000 unique visitors um, uh, annually. Um, we see that the website uh, is uh, something which constantly generates uh, a lot of debate among policymakers uh, with people realizing that we need more transparency and accountability in the way our owners of media outlets report, for instance, about their other interests and their other um, uh, assets, which uh, at the moment we cannot see. And I would expect that in a couple of years, um, to say the least, uh, we should have some changes to the law um, uh, that uh, would allow us to see uh, this particular information uh, about media owners, something which we could not have possibly expected a number of years ago. Now, obviously this is not uh, uh, to say that we don't do any other work. And uh, this is our annual reporting slide, which basically shows you that with uh, uh, all the online work in hand, which is again on your left side, with that 151,000 uh, written in blue, we do a lot of other stuff. It's not like you cannot do other things while you're uh, focusing on online tools. Uh, online tools really are for you to help people go and do certain things themselves and be able to relate to your, the work that you do. Uh, but at the bottom uh, of all of it is uh, this clear understanding that if you uh, just do it uh, by yourself at the end of the day, you can only look at so many meetings per day and you can actually meet only so many people per year. Um, something which uh, nowadays would not be really smart because even if you manage to reach out 5,000 people directly, you're missing out on hundreds of thousands of people that can use things that you've developed, initiatives that you have uh, by themselves with the help of their laptops alone. But frankly, I think that this is something which one could go on and on and on about uh, with all those different examples at hand, and I'm sure that you have a lot of stories of your own to share. But what I would like to tell you is that um, there are probably a couple of uh, essential lessons one can take from our own study and our own experience. Uh, what I have realized um, over the past couple of years is that a lot of times we work in silos and we don't talk to each other enough. Uh, NGOs talk just to NGOs, IT developers talk just to IT developers, journalists hang out with the, the media community. And the reality of it is that this is something which we cannot allow to happen. Uh, if we want to succeed, we have to succeed together. And that is the only way we can actually move forward. So talk to each other. Uh, uh, that's what we do on a um, daily basis in Lithuania. I think a lot of times it is uh, NGOs that have to initiate this conversation because they've been in this particular field of work longer. They should know better. They should have, lo they should have learned from their failures and their successes and they should realize that a lot of people that come in into a particular field of work might be very enthusiastic at the beginning and not realize that not everything is just in their hands. And that is why I think that, um, uh, again, you have to be understanding, patient, and also creative. There's no single way to succeed. Uh, I briefly touched upon the three initiatives that uh, we did out of a number of uh, the work, uh, out of the number of the initiatives that we conducted in Lithuania over the past 10 years. And uh, there's no single answer as to how to come up with a particular online portal or a particular data set. Sometimes it's an individual who comes your way. Sometimes it's you approaching an institution. But at the end of the day, as an NGO, uh, a lot of times you're in the mix of things. You can also not only develop a particular online portal, you can also tell about it to the media. You can present it well so that it's being picked up and uh, people talk about it on a daily basis. And finally, I think that it's really important to let certain things go and realize that each and every one of us has certain strengths that we should play to. Um, it would be very sad uh, if uh, we were to uh, let history repeat uh, itself and uh, each and every one of us would be keen on making the same mistakes that the others have made before. I think that uh, well, NGOs uh, should realize that uh, certain things are already there. Uh, there's no need to develop your own IT capacities if you can 
partner up with IT developers. Uh, there's probably no need to come up uh, with a team of investigative journalists that necessarily sit in your organization. If you have a group of wonderful people working for a particular, particular media outlet, the question is how to really cooperate and how to make sure that you agree on a particular goal and uh, go and get it. Uh, my experience has been is that it's possible. Um, I uh, am happy to answer any questions that you have, and uh, I hope by now you have Googled where Lithuania is, and all of you can raise your hands if I ask you whether you know where I come from. So, thank you so much, and uh, you can always reach me at Sergeyus at transparency.lt, or you can check out what we do at transparencyschool.org uh, if you're interested in getting our mindset uh, in greater detail. So, thank you. That, that's actually a very good question. I, I would not be as brave as to say that, yes, it's because uh, of our work, only because of our work, that the Corruption Perceptions Index in Lithuania has been improving. But what I can tell you is that we see uh, a very clear trend. Uh, people in Lithuania um, are changing. Um, they don't want to pay bribes uh, the way they did 10 years ago. Uh, people are more self-entitled they realize that they should receive better service for the taxes that they pay. And I think this is precisely the point. Uh, with corruption, uh, or any anti-corruption work for that matter, you will not uh, be able to put every single person to jail, nor should you. What you can do is enable people to seek information and exercise their right to know and by that, mobilize support to the work that you do. And then you see that politicians and public servants listen more carefully and start acting in the way that they would not have acted 10 years ago. And I can give you just one example. Three days ago, um, yes, three days ago, news broke that uh, the Special Investigation Service, the anti-corruption agency in Lithuania, uh, suspects the head of our Liberal Party to have taken a large bribe from uh, a uh, uh, very large business uh, in, in Lithuania. I think 10 years ago, uh, it would be expected that this politician uh, would start denying uh, his wrongdoing, uh, uh, would not go into any conversation, uh, and it would take many, many months and years to get anywhere with that. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, this particular politician now uh, has resigned from his position as the head of that party, uh, has stated that he intends to give away his parliamentary mandate so that law enforcement can investigate this particular case as objectively and um, as easily as possible, which I think is a clear indication how the country is changing because of the changing public expectation with the help of such things. Thank you. Thank you.